you. Uh, we will uh, have our regular press conference on COVID-19. Uh, okay, you know, we're going to uh, go to a briefing to live France, from Geneva, Switzerland with Dr. Tedros. Uh, uh, the WHO uh, uh, um, Director General, Dr. Michael Ryan, uh, you and Executive Director uh, of Health and Emergencies, um, today, uh, Dr. Uh, Maria have, uh, Van Director General Dr. Tedros, Perhof. Dr. Maria Van Kerkhove, and Dr. Mike Ryan. Uh, as usual, uh, we will have an audio file immediately available and transcript a little bit uh, later in the evening or tomorrow. I will give, give floor to Dr. Tedros for opening remarks. Dr. Tedros, please. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Tariq. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. The COVID-19 pandemic is straining health systems in many countries. The rapidly increasing demand on health facilities and health workers threatens to leave some health systems overstretched and unable to operate effectively. Previous outbreaks have demonstrated that when health systems are overwhelmed, deaths due to vaccine-preventable and treatable conditions increase dramatically. Even though we are in the midst of a crisis, essential health services must continue. Babies are still being born. Vaccines must still be delivered and people still need life-saving treatment for a range of other diseases. WHO has published guidelines to help countries balance the demands of responding directly to COVID-19 while maintaining essential health services. This includes a set of targeted immediate actions to reorganize and maintain access to high-quality essential health services, including routine vaccination, care during pregnancy and childbirth, treatment for infectious and non-communicable diseases, and mental health conditions, blood services, and more. That includes ensuring an adequate health workforce to deal with the many health needs other than COVID. 19. For example, we are pleased by the 20,000 health workers in the UK who have offered to return to work and that other countries such as Russian Federation are involving medical students and trainees in the response. To help countries manage the surge in COVID-19 cases while maintaining essential services, WHO has also published a detailed practical manual on how to set up and manage treatment centers for COVID-19. The manual covers three major interventions. First, how to set up screening and triage at health facilities using a repurposed building or a tent. Second, how to set up community facilities to care for mild patients. And third, how to set up a treatment center by repurposing hospital wards or entire hospitals or by setting up a new hospital in a tent. The manual covers structural design, infection prevention and control measures, and ventilation systems. This is a life-saving instruction manual to deal with the surge of cases that some countries are facing right now. These facilities will also have longer-term benefits for health systems once the current crisis is over. In addition to having facilities for patients, it's also vital that countries have sufficient supplies of diagnostics, protective equipment, and other medical supplies. Ensuring free movement of essential health products is vital for saving lives and curbing the social and economic impacts of the pandemic. Earlier today, 
I spoke to trade ministers from the G20 countries about ways to address the chronic shortage of personal protective equipment and other essential medical supplies. We call on countries to work with companies to increase production, to ensure the free movement of essential health products, and to ensure equitable distribution of those products based on need. Specific attention should be given to low- and middle-income countries in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. In addition, WHO is working intensively with several partners to massively increase access to life-saving products, including diagnostics, PPE, medical oxygen, ventilators, and more. We understand that many countries are implementing measures that restrict the movement of people. In implementing these measures, it's vital to respect the dignity and welfare of all people. It's also important that governments keep their people informed about the intended duration of measures and to support for older people, refugees, and other vulnerable groups. Governments need to ensure the welfare of people who have lost their income and are in desperate need of food, sanitation, and other essential services. Countries should work hand in hand with communities to build trust and support resilience and mental health. Two months ago, WHO published the Strategic Preparedness and Response Plan with an initial ask of $675 million to support countries to prepare for and respond to COVID-19. We're very grateful to the many countries and foundations who have contributed. More than $622 million US dollars have been received so far. And I would like to use this opportunity to thank King Salman Center of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia for humanitarian relief for its contribution of $10 million US dollars. We continue to be encouraged by the signs of global solidarity to confront and overcome this common threat. The commitment of G20 countries to work together to improve the production and equitable supply of essential products shows that the world is coming together. And coming together is the only option we have. Unity is the only option we have to defeat this virus. Yesterday, I sent a tweet with a single word, humility. Some people asked me why. Why I sent a single word on the Twitter saying humility. COVID-19 is reminding us how vulnerable we are, how connected we are, and how dependent we are on each other. In the eye of a storm like COVID, scientific and public health tools are essential, but so are humility and kindness. With solidarity, humility, and assuming the best of each other, we can and we will overcome this together. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Tedros. We will start uh, with questions. I will remind journalists that we can take only one question per person, so we can advance as much uh, as possible. So we will start uh, with the Lusa News Agency. That's a Portuguese-speaking news agency. Can you hear us? Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Is it Antonio? Yes, this is Antonio. Thank you. Please go ahead. Well, uh, I would like to ask a question uh, on the issues of birth and newborn care and breastfeeding. Does the WHO recommend any restrictions on breastfeeding, presence of partners in delivery rooms, and skin-on-skin -skin contact between mother and child because of the pandemic? Because uh, health authorities on country like my own, Portugal, have banned these practices for women that are infected. Thank you.
Thank you for the question. Um, so we have recently published some guidance on uh, clinical management of individuals who have COVID-19, which includes um, pregnant women and uh, lactating women, breastfeeding women. Um, and it is very important that um, women are able to breastfeed their children uh, when they're born. Um, there are certain precautions that, that need to be uh, taken place in terms of contact precautions, um, but we outline the ways in which that could be done safely. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Van Kierkov. I, I hope this answers the question. Uh, I just uh, uh, been told that there was a little problem at the beginning of the audio uh, for people who were on a Zoom, so please listen uh, to uh, the audio file that we'll send immediately after if you have missed uh, those few first seconds. Uh, we go to next question. Uh, do we have Al Jazeera online? Yes, Al Jazeera. Okay. Andy, if you can just uh, speak a little bit louder, please go ahead. Yes, thank you, thank you. Um, I'm Randy Moneta with Al Jazeera. Um, so I'd like to ask you with um, regard to the coronavirus pandemic in Indonesia, because as of today, there have been more than 1,400 confirmed cases and 122 deaths in Indonesia, which is the most of any country in, in Southeast Asia. Um, so um, what needs to be done more by the Indonesian authorities in this case. Thank you. <clears throat> um, I'll uh, have a go at the question and maybe the Director General will supplement. Um, while the pandemic is uh, very well developed and escalating in, in many parts of the world, particularly in, in, in Europe and in North America, um, there are countries who are still in the earlier part of the, the pandemic. Um, it remains to be seen how the pandemic will develop in those countries, but countries with relatively known numbers of cases, and I would count Indonesia in that, uh, have uh, the opportunity to implement a comprehensive strategy focused on containment and on suppression of spread and on strengthening the health system for uh, a likely increase in demand. Uh, regardless of the scenario, <clears throat> it is likely that the number of cases will rise and therefore that the demands on the health system will grow. Uh, therefore, it's really important that the health system is prepared for any increase in cases. At the same time, uh, you have to put pressure on the virus. You have to go after the virus, like other countries in the region have shown in Southeast Asia, going after the virus, uh, detecting all cases, uh, testing all suspect cases, isolating cases, uh, and putting uh, con identifying contacts, following them, and putting them into quarantine um, or, <clears throat> or home isolation is uh, is the way to go. And matching that with a strong uh, community education and engagement approach, and this needs to be built from the communities up. So, an all of society, all of community approach, focused on both containing the virus where you have clusters and small numbers of cases and where you have uh, efficient or widespread community transmission to be sure that the health systems in those areas are prepared to deal with what, with what will be a large influx of cases. Uh, we believe the, the, um, that that is what uh, Indonesia are attempting and we will do everything to support the government there in doing that. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ryan. Uh, yeah. No, thank you. Thank you so much. I just wanted to add to what uh, Mike said. We are working very closely with uh, uh, Indonesia. Uh, we had a discussion with the uh, foreign minister and then followed with uh, His Excellency uh, the President, and we are aligned with uh, what the response uh, should be, and we will boost our cooperation uh, with regard to to the COVID uh, situation with Indonesia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ryan. Dr. Tedros, uh, next question is Mohammed from uh, Sharq al Awsat. Can you hear us, Mohammed? Yeah, yeah, I hear you. Um, uh, my question is that the uh, United States allow the use of chloroquine to treat the coronavirus. Will the chloroquine be effective in the treatment? And does the World Health Organization recommend the use of chloroquine to other governments? Thank you. Yeah. I will begin, and Maria will give some more technical detail. Uh, 
so, so that we're clear, there is no proven effective therapeutic or drug against COVID-19. However, there are a number of drugs that have shown promise, uh, either in previous treatment of coronaviruses like MERS or SARS, in the fight against HIV, um, or uh, in other situations. And there is some preliminary data from non-randomized uh, studies, observational studies, that indicate that some drugs and some drug cocktails may have an impact. Some of those uh, drugs may impact the length of disease, some may impact the severity of disease, uh, and uh, the dosage of, uh, dosages of those drugs, when they're given, to what patient, at what stage of the disease, uh, has not been standardized. And we've never had a comparison group where we've had a randomized approach to treatment with the drug or not treatment with the drug. Uh, it is very important that we continue to accelerate the implementation of the randomized controlled trials that have already begun all over the world, including the WHO coordinated Solidarity 1 trial. Um, but there are other large scale trials, trials underway in various parts of the world. Um, it's also very important that those drugs are very, very needed for the treatment of other diseases and that we don't see a situation where people who need those drugs for the treatment of other diseases cannot access them because uh, people are just buying them up and using them. Uh, some countries may introduce compassionate use rules which allow physicians to use those drugs in certain situations off-label. That is a matter for national regulatory authorities. Uh, we, don't we don't encourage that if it leads to widespread use because it will, in effect, uh, divert drugs away from the diseases that the, these drugs are used for. Uh, and we really want to accelerate the, the trials that will give us the actual answers that we need. We also need to look at how to scale up the production of those drugs that will prove effective in the clinical trials. Maria? Thank you very much, Dr. Ryan. I will um, uh, read one question that's from Today News Africa. And the question is that uh, WHO Africa office uh, acknowledged last week that the African continent does not have the capacity to produce respirators and ventilators at the moment. What type of support can WHO provide to African countries to quickly uh, get uh, the material that it's needed? Um, as the DG indicated, uh, we've already sent uh, uh, large numbers of protective equipment and diagnostic tests to Africa. All countries in Africa can now make the diagnosis of COVID um, with support from ourselves, from Africa CDC and from others. We've been working with the World Food Program, the Jack Ma Foundation uh, uh, and Africa CDC to bring PPE into uh, Africa as well as supplies from our own stockpile in, uh, which is based in Dubai. Uh, it is not enough. Um, and you're correct, the, the issue of ventilators is a very uh, difficult issue. One, because ventilators are technologically sophisticated, expensive, difficult to produce and distribute, and require very high levels of training in order to use them properly. There are lots of innovation at the moment uh, in, 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 in how we can scale up the production uh, of ventilators uh, and even use the ventilators that don't require a patient to be intubated. In other words, how can you support ventilation in a conscious patient? And there are all kinds of interesting solutions emerging on that front. The issue is getting those solutions uh, to scale. But the one thing I will say from the perspective of supporting a severely ill patient, oxygen is something we need to discuss because everybody's talking about ventilators and that's important. A critically ill person struggling to breathe, a ventilator can be life-saving. But before that happens, what truly is life-saving is, is the ability of a patient to be given supplemental oxygen in order that they, their, the, the concentration of oxygen in their blood can be kept at a high level. Because that's what patients suffer when they can't breathe properly. The level of oxygen in their blood drops, and you'll hear people talking about oxygen saturation. It means how much oxygen is getting into someone's blood from their lungs. When someone has COVID-19, your lungs struggle to put enough oxygen into your blood. By increasing the concentration of oxygen in the air that someone breathes, you allow more oxygen to reach the blood. Every country in Africa has oxygen, and we need also to focus on getting uh, better 
uh, distribution of medical oxygen so patients with moderate severe disease can benefit from that. We will work, and we are working with the World Food Programme. We're working with uh, the UN in New York, and the DG has spoken to the efforts we're making to not only scale up the distribution of such equipment and supplies, but to coordinate that in a way that countries can expect a more smooth uh, service in, in, in accessing those vital supplies. If I could just add something very briefly, this is, a, this is a very good opportunity to bring more clinicians and medical professionals on board with us who are into our clinical networks so that they can learn from and share experiences of dealing with COVID-19 patients. Not all countries are overwhelmed right now with patients. Some have very few patients. And it's, it's time right now where we can be sharing experiences. We could be doing trainings that actually look at how patients are treated and what type of care um, patients who develop either moderate, severe, or critical disease could be cared for. So we could bring them on board and join our teleconferences that happen regularly with clinicians all over the world. Thank you very much, sure. Maria. The next question is uh, Christiana Ulrich from uh, DPA German News Agency. Christiana, can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Uh, yes, please go ahead. Yes, uh, this is a question on Austria. The Austrian government has decided to, or to make everyone wear a mask who's going into the shops. I understood from our previous briefings with you that um, the general public should not wear masks because uh, they are in short supply. What do you say about the new Austrian measures? Um, thank you. Uh, I, I'm not uh, specifically aware of that measure in, Aus in Austria. Um, I would assume that it's aimed at people who could are potentially have the disease, not passing it to others. In general, WHO uh, recommends that the wearing of a mask by a member of the public is to prevent that individual giving the disease to somebody else. We don't generally recommend the wearing of masks in public by otherwise well individuals uh, because uh, it has not been up to now associated with any particular benefit. It does have benefits psychologically, socially, and there are social norms around that, and we don't criticize the wearing of masks and have not done so. But there is no specific evidence to suggest that the wearing of masks by the mass population has any particular benefit. In fact, there's some evidence to suggest the, the opposite in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the misuse or wearing a mask properly or fitting it properly or taking it off and all the other risks that are otherwise associated with that. And there also is the issue that we have a massive global shortage and where should these masks be and where are the best benefit? Because one can argue that there's a benefit of anything, but where does a given tool have its most benefit? And right now, the people most at risk from this virus are frontline health workers who are exposed to the virus every second of every day. The thought of them not having masks is, is, is horrific. Uh, so we have to be very careful on supply. But that is not the primary reason why WHO has advised uh, against using masks at a mass population level. But I'll pass to Maria on the technical side. You may have something to add. Thanks. No, only to reinforce what Mike has said, that our recommendations are for, in the community, we don't recommend the use of wearing masks unless you yourself are sick and as a, as a measure to prevent onward spread from you if you are ill. The masks that we recommend are for people who are at home and who are sick and for those individuals who are caring for those people who are home that are sick. But as Mike has said, it's, it's important that our frontline workers, who we recommend standard and droplet precautions, have adequate uh, use of PPE, um, and so that we make sure that we prioritize the use of masks for those who need it most. Thank you very much. Uh, next question from India, from uh, Banjo Kaur, down to earth. Banjo, can you hear us? Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Uh, Dr. Ryan, uh, you must be aware that India, as part of its lockdown, is witnessing unprecedented humanitarian crisis in the form of movement of migrants from one part of the country to other. I do understand that you do not like commenting on individual countries, but this is an unprecedented humanitarian crisis. So what would be your advice to our government? And second question, it's, it's not a question, it's just a clarification. 
none of our uh, none of the situation reports given by who says community transmission is happening in any of the countries uh, while we do know it is happening so could you please clarify on that can you just repeat the second part of your question uh, i i said the the situation reports which who gives us every day uh, there are countries and the stage of transmission mentioned against those countries against none of the country there is mention of community transmission while we do know that some countries are witnessing community transmission so could you please clarify on that yeah i i think we'll go back and look at our websites and and, and see if uh, the, the situation there we we i don't believe we've indicated that there is no community transmission in, in somewhere like like india but we we will definitely check that but going back to i think what is the more important part of your question which is the 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 impact of uh, of 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 lockdowns uh, movement restrictions in in any situation are very number one uh, need to be taken very carefully um and two obviously uh, regardless of their intent uh, uh are, are very difficult to accept uh, by communities and, and and by others because people need to move and want to move for family reasons for economic reasons and and for for many other reasons um and it's important that governments communicate openly and transparently with their people as to the reasons why lockdowns or shutdowns or movement restrictions are occurring because they do impinge on people's freedom of movement and if people and communities are to offer up that freedom of movement they do need to understand why that's happening uh it's also uh and those move those movement restrictions uh are regrettable uh, in all situations nobody wants to see those happen but in situations where you have a very very intense epidemic in one part of a country and another part of a country it's not so intense you may have to implement some measure uh to at least encourage sometimes it's advice sometimes it's strong advice and sometimes it's a restriction where transport is stopped uh each government has to choose the the balance between what is advice to communities and what is uh, uh, uh what is uh, in some senses an enforced uh lockdown uh, whatever is chosen it's really important that communication and acceptance by the community is at the center of the concern of the government it is impossible to have an effective um restriction of movement without a community on board with that restriction of movement at all levels uh, and as the dg said in his speech when such measures are put in place it's exceptionally important that those measures are carried out uh, with not only the acceptance but with the human rights and dignity of the people affected at the center uh now that is not always easy uh but that is what should be as part at center of the objective of the process and i'm not here speaking specifically about india i'm speaking about uh this in general terms but i think what it does speak to is that these society wide measures are difficult they are not easy uh and they are hurting people uh but the alternative is even worse and countries if they're going to be able to move away from this approach of of having to lock down and shut down if we're going to move away from that approach as a means of suppressing the virus we have got to put in place the public health surveillance the isolation the quarantine the case finding the detection we have got to be able to show that we can go after the virus because lockdowns alone will not work but unfortunately in some situations right now there the only measure that governments can actually take to slow down this virus uh and and that's unfortunate but that is the reality and we need to continually explain the reasons for this to our communities so thank you this is uh, a very important question um maybe on the first one based on the transmission in countries who has categorized actually countries into four there are countries with no cases what we call the four cs no cases are a group of countries and then the second is countries with sporadic 
uh, cases. And the third is cases, uh, countries uh, with clusters of cases. And the fourth is community transmission. And we have now a number of countries with community transmission. And that's why we have developed a guideline that's tailored to these four situations. And please check our website and you will find the four Cs and the four categories and what should be done based on, on this. But we have community transmission in many countries and we have said it many times. And then on the um, issue of um, uh, lockdown, so-called lockdown, maybe, um, uh, you know, some countries have already taken measures for physical distancing, closing schools and preventing gatherings and so on. That can buy, buy time. But at the same time, uh, each and every country actually differs. Some countries have strong social welfare system. And some countries don't. And I'm from Africa, as, as you know. And I know many people actually have to work every single day to win their daily bread. And governments should take this population into account, okay? If we're closing or if we're limiting movements, what is it going to happen to those people who have to work on daily basis and have to earn their bread on daily basis? So each and every country based on its situation should answer this question. We're not seeing it as an economic impact on a country, as an average of uh, GDP loss or, uh, you know, the economic uh, repercussions. We have to also see what it means to the individual in, in the street. And maybe I have seen it, said it many times, and um, uh, I come from a poor family, and I know what it means to always, uh, you know, worry about your daily bread. And that has to be taken into account. Because each and every individual matters. And how each and every individual is affected by our, our, our actions has to be considered. And that's what we're, we're saying. It's about any country. It's not about India, it's about any country on earth. Even the wealthiest country on earth can have people who need to work for their daily bread. No country is immune. Each and every country has to really make sure that this is taken into account. Thank you very much. Uh, next question, uh, Associated Press, uh, Jamie. I can hear you. Yes. Great. Uh, good. Good afternoon. Um, my question has to do with um, the situation in some European countries. Um, <clears throat> we've seen some signs that um, countries like Italy and Spain um, may be um, sensing that they are reaching the peak, um, and that uh, I believe the UK also mentioned uh, some some experts there, or one expert there mentioned that they may be nearing a peak. I'm just wondering um, if you have any estimates. I know that, Mike, you said uh, on Friday that there's no way to, to, uh, uh, to sort of see the end of this, but uh, what about peaking? Do you see any, any signs of peaking within Europe? Thanks. Um, if, you, if you just look at the, the extent of transmission in three, those uh, three countries you mentioned, they're... Um, and we wouldn't compare them to Korea or to Japan or to Singapore in terms of their situation. They have much more extensive problems. Um, and then if you compare them to what happened in China, uh, and specifically in Wuhan, which was the most intense epidemic, we did see, uh, and among, we, we, rather than basing this on modeling, let's base it on experience, right? Uh, we saw what happened in Wuhan after the lockdown. 
Uh, and not only did they do that <clears throat> physical distancing and put people in their homes, but they continued to look for cases. That's the essential difference. They continued to detect cases and isolate all cases, including mild cases, away from their families. But let's assume they've done that. Uh, uh, what we saw over a period of days, and I think you were one of the people who asked the question during the Wuhan event, do you think this is stabilizing? Is it going down? And for a number of days, you know, we said, well, we can't tell, and it went up and down and up and down. So what we're likely to see, if you imagine the lockdowns and the stringent measures that were put in place are now in place between two and three weeks in Italy at different levels and different places. We should start to see a stabilisation uh, because the cases we see today really reflect exposures two weeks ago. So the cases you see today are almost like uh, historical in the same way when we're told that we're looking at galaxies uh, through a telescope, that we're seeing light from a billion years ago. We're seeing a reality that existed before. When you count your cases on a daily basis in an epidemic, it reflects a reality of transmission and risk two weeks before at least. So in that sense, what we see today is what happened two weeks ago. Um, and what we hope to see is those numbers stabilizing, which will reflect the fact that exposure started to drop over time. And some countries, as I said on Friday, have seen that through the number of contacts per case. When they've continued to look for cases, they've still done contact tracing. And what they've found through the physical distancing measures and the stay-at-home orders is the number of significant contacts per case has dropped from the 20s to 15, to 12, to 10, to 8, to 4, which means less people have been exposed to that case than, than would have been two weeks ago, which shows people are distancing. For whatever reason, they're distancing. So there are less people at risk from any individual case. If you get those cases out of the community quickly, they'll expose even less people. And that's how you get ahead of an epidemic. Uh, so do we hope that uh, Italy and Spain are nearly there on that? Yes. But the way you stabilize and then move to zero, and I think everyone's talked about the, the curve up and everyone talks about the stabilization. The question is, how do you go down? Uh, and going down isn't just about a lockdown and let go. To get down from the numbers, not just stabilise, requires a redoubling of public health efforts to push down. Not, it won't go down by itself. It will be pushed down. And that's what we need countries to focus on. What is the strategy now to put in place the public health measures that will push down the virus after those measures may be released, and then how do we take care of people better in a clinical environment to save more lives? So, yes, potentially stabilizing, and it is our fervent hope that that is the case. But we have to now push the virus down, and that will not happen by itself. And if I could just add to that, I would... I was going to say, which Mike has just said, is we need to focus on the now. We need to focus on what must be done now to get us out of this. And there is this, I understand completely, the desire to want to know when we will reach the peak uh, and, and when we will start seeing that decline. But that will not happen on its own. These, these physical distancing measures, these stay-at-home measures, have bought us a little bit of time, a little window of time, and that short window has to be used appropriately so that we get systems in place to look for this virus aggressively um, through testing, through, through isolation, through finding contacts, through quarantining those contacts, through caring for further patients, because we will still see patients, and many patients are still going to require need, to support other countries that are going to go through this. So the focusing on what we do now is absolutely critical to make sure we use that time wisely we use that time effectively so that we do, once we do reach that peak, um, that we continue to push and suppress that virus down as quickly as, as possible, but still be ready to find additional cases should they show up. What we've seen in a number of countries in Asia and that where they've brought this, this virus down, they've brought transmission down, they're now seeing repeat introductions from outside of their countries. They have not let their guard down. They are still aggressively looking for those cases as they come in and suppressing it so that it doesn't start again. So we need to focus on the now. 
uh, we need to use our time wisely, and that is to aggressively find this virus and care for our patients. Thank you very much. Next question is uh, from Nippon TV, Atsuko. Atsuko, can you hear us? Can we try one more time with the Nippon TV? Okay. That's okay. So let's go. Let's go to Jim from uh, Westwood One. Jim, can you hear us? Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, very good afternoon to you. I, I would like to clarify a little bit on the chloroquine issue in the U.S. Uh, and it should be important to point out that the FDA hasn't approved it for wide uh, prescription by doctors, but only in a hospital setting, and the doctors there can only get it from the national stockpile. But my question is, what exactly was observed with chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine that could lead to the possibility of it being used to treat COVID-19 in a hospital setting? And what do you mean exactly by randomized testing as opposed to uh, non-randomized testing? If you can answer those, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Mm. Uh, Maria will, will, will supplement. I mean, there was some what people will describe as in vitro evidence, evidence in the lab that the drug was active against uh, the virus, but uh, any number of things are active against viruses in a Chlorine is active against viruses, but uh, uh, other things are active against viruses. The question is whether they're safe and effective to put in a human body and whether they will be absorbed and processed in a way that the virus can be attacked and not the body. Um, <clears throat> from the perspective of uh, chloroquine, there were also some small uh, observational studies, uh, one in France, that uh, followed a small number of patients where there was no uh, uh, randomization of those patients and looked at their outcomes. Patients were admitted at different stages uh, of illness and it were the outcomes that were really focused on was the length of illness. And the observation that was made was that people, uh, <clears throat> length of illness or length of hospitalization or length of significant systems, uh, significant symptoms was reduced. <clears throat> no one here is talking about cure. No one here is talking about taking a magic pill and all of a sudden you recover from COVID. Everyone's looking for therapies that will shorten the disease illness will prevent people going from moderate to severe and will prevent those that are critical dying. And drugs act in different ways. <clears throat> Some drugs may actually prevent the virus replicating early in the disease and therefore shorten the length of the illness and reduce, uh, reduce uh, the, the progression to severe disease. Once the disease is very well established and the, in a later stage of the disease, a lot of the damage that's been caused by the virus has not necessarily been caused by the virus itself, but all of the secondary effects, the inflammation, the drug, or the, the organ failure, and other things that happen. So uh, a lot of antiviral therapies are focused on getting a, a person with, uh, with the disease uh, treated at an earlier stage of disease. And if you look at a lot of the anti-flu medications like, uh, <clears throat> like Tamiflu and others, their main... Uh, benefit that has been found for those, again, has been shortening the course of illness. Uh, with regards to randomized control trials, um, the importance of having a control group is to have a comparison uh, and then be able to stratify your patients because if I have uh, a drug and I treat a very severe patient who's uh, very uh, of, of, of an older age with the drug and that person dies, does it mean that that drug didn't work? And if I treat a really healthy young person who's got a moderate disease and they recover, does that mean the drug worked? Uh, and I don't think any of us need to be rocket scientists to work out that there are many factors that predict recovery or predict death. And what we have to separate and we have to distill out is what is the effect of the drug itself, not the age of the patient, not the condition of the patient, uh, and so many other factors that can affect survival. We've all been through infectious diseases ourselves and we recover. Is that because, you know, we get out of one side of the bed or the other? No, we wouldn't assume that that was affecting the outcome of the illness. There are many natural things affecting illness outcome, including 
the hard work of doctors and nurses in supporting the patient and preventing organ failure and ventilating the patient. So the difficult thing at this moment is distilling out the specific effect of a drug in a complex illness. Uh, and that's what we're trying to do with the randomized control trials. And that's why we need so many patients in those trials across many countries, many age groups, genders, uh, many uh, phases of the disease, and many levels of severity. And then we can break out what is the actual effect of the drug on the outcome of the disease. Okay, um, so that's it for uh, WHO um, today, and next up will be um, the update from the BC, um, the province of BC, and in which case we'll probably hear from Adrian Dix and um, Bonnie Henry.